a problem. to leave my notes at home. So it's just as well we've got a PowerPoint that uh, we can look at and uh, we can think about. So I want to still not work. Okay, if it goes off again it means I've got a flat battery in spite of putting new batteries in. So I want to talk to you today about what it is to be spiritual and what makes us spiritual. And this is where I had a whole bunch of uh, One, two. Yeah, I'm on. So there's a few passages I wanted to look at. Uh, in other parts of scripture than the Bible reading today, and I did PowerPoint. So let me just, uh, in broad brush, say what I would have, was going to say. So there's one passage, I think it's in Galatians, where Paul, speaking to the Galatians after having talked about the fruit of the Spirit, tells them that we shouldn't just simply uh, believe in the Spirit, but we should follow and do what is consistent with knowing Him in our lives. The, uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, pick up on, and this is where I'll, I'll, I'll jump over a whole bunch of that stuff that would have been in my notes. I want to, uh, let me make sure I'm working here. Um, that's interesting. Worked before. Oh, there we go. I want to talk about the baptism of the Spirit first of all. <laughs> And this will just be a very, very, very ultra summary of what that's about. And I want to talk about it because of the way that some people interpret one particular passage. And I want to make sure that we understand that issue before we proceed to talking about the filling of the Spirit. So in, in Matthew 3, we find... Um, Right, there we go. We find Jesus, uh, sorry, we find the Apostle John is at the Jordan baptising people. And uh, he sees the Sadducees coming and the Pharisees coming and they want to be baptised too. And he says words to this effect, you know, you brood of vipers, who told you to come and escape what the wrath that is to come? And uh, John is being very, very clear and blunt toward these people who are basically hypocrites and he knows it and that's what he's calling out they wanted to be seen to be doing the right thing but actually their hearts were as black as black in terms of their relationship with God ultimately they turned a relationship with God into rules and regulations and so let me say at that point something else which is kind of sideways but it actually connects in the end. Who knows scripture best in the universe apart from God and the angels in heaven? Satan. 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 Dead right. But there are some people who will want to tell you that the measure of your spirituality is how much scripture you know. And I want to emphatically say that is not automatically the case. That our knowledge can help us to grow in our relationship with God is pretty obvious, I hope. And we ought to be looking at it as much as we're able. And that will depend on a whole lot of issues. Um, in the first century, they didn't have the New Testament. In fact, they didn't even have the Old Testament in a single book like we do. They had it but it was scrolls in a temple and people would come and hear it read and the Sadducees and the, the scribes, they would pour over those scrolls to seek understanding. And that's fine, but most people didn't. Does that mean that the ancients weren't spiritual people? That they had no real sense of who God was? I think absolutely not. You know, I've known several Downs people over the years 
uh, Down syndrome that is, and that I, I met some of the most spiritual people ever. They loved Jesus. They loved God. To hear them pray was, well, one in particular, hearing pray was awesome. Sure, his vocabulary was limited. Sure, there were um, some issues of understanding that were a little bit, you know, we might sort of put a question mark on. But you could not question the relationship. It was alive and vital and uh, truthful. Now, the reason I put this passage up on the, on the screen is that this, John then talks about um, the baptism with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John had said, I baptise you with water, in water for repentance, but the one who comes after me is more powerful than I, and I am not fit to carry his sandals. He, meaning Jesus of course, will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So the and fire gets interpreted about three basic ways. One is that people see it as synonymous with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They're one and the same thing. Others would see baptism of the Holy Spirit as one thing and the baptism of fire as another, but both are applicable to believers. And that the baptism of fire is something that happens subsequent to our conversion because the baptism of the Spirit occurs at our conversion. The moment we put our trust in Jesus, the Spirit enters our lives and we are baptised by Him into the body of Christ, uh, both in this world and beyond. So that is, in classic uh, Pentecostal and charismatic terms, that usually is associated with having a time of tarrying, calling on God, uh, surrendering to God, and all of that is good, by the way. But is the baptism of fire an appropriate theological expression? Sorry, is, is that experience an appropriate theological expression of what this passage is saying? Because that's what they typically will point to. The other um, is that actually they're two completely different and separated experiences. One for believers and the other for those who are under judgment. And if I've got the slides right. This is kind of weird. There we go. Um, that's just a repeat. And so is that. Oh, that was on. Oops. Which one, Ray? Yeah, let's go back. So in, uh, in verse 12, so he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And we also need to look back a little bit. Which one, Ray? The next one. And yeah. the next. Why are we in a loop? And the next. Right. If we go back, we see that John... Actually, that's interesting. Okay. <laughs> hmm. I've got my slides mixed up here. So... John, remember, had seen the Pharisees coming. He'd already had a go at them. Jesus hadn't yet showed up to be baptised by John. And so the words are in this context. These vipers who uh, are uh, distracting from what is going on and making themselves look good when the reality is they weren't. And so... I believe that baptism with fire is a separate baptism indeed, but it's for the unbeliever. That ultimately, when life is done, 
they will receive a baptism as one of fire. And I think uh, John is making this abundantly clear here, actually. If you take the verse out of its context, you can readily understand it very differently. But if you look at it in its context, it's clear what the baptism is about. Because, in addition to what I've said, when John addresses the crowd, he says, all of you will be baptised in the spirit and fire. Surely he doesn't mean that every single person standing in front of him, even the majority, will become believers and receive the spirit. So let me just underline one last thing, which I've already said, but I just want to be crystal clear. The baptism of the spirit is that which we receive at conversion. And before I go any further, there was, I just remembered my first note <laughs> that I had, uh, and I, I want to sort of go back, if you, as it were. Some of what I'm saying this morning, you may not have heard, because we as Baptists aren't good at looking at the work of the Spirit. We tend to kind of sideline it. We, we acknowledge He's there. We hope that He's leading us. We, uh, and some of us have a, a much deeper relationship with Him than others. My personal history, and Judy and, and uh, will know in particular, um, I was very much anti-charismatic, like unbelievably anti. It took me going to another state because I thought that the college principal here, namely Noel Vos, was a heretic, which was utterly ridiculous. But that's what I thought at the time. That gives you a clue about where my head was at. I think in several churches before people got to know me and they heard me speak on something like this, couldn't make up their mind whether I was charismatic or not. Well, in a biblical definition, we are all charismatic. In a sociological sense and in a theological sense, um, outside of what I've just said, I'm probably not, and then I probably am. It's kind of weird. So if you want to challenge me on that later and talk to me about that, I'd welcome that and hopefully can clarify. So let's see if this will go again. Right. So the reading we had today was from uh, Ephesians 5, 8, uh, 5.15 rather but the key verse that I want us to look at today is this one do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery but be filled with the spirit and if you grasp what this is about it's wonderful it's joyful, it's awesome and it's so helpful to life but let's just break it down just a little bit at first, it might sound like Paul's giving a contrast between being drunk and being filled. And that's true. There is a contrast. Um, when we're filled with the Spirit, we're not drunk in the sense that we are with alcohol. But there is also a comparison. So the comparison is summed up if we understand what the word filled means. Now, there are a number of places in the New Testament where this word is used. Typically, as you might expect, it has a relationship with quantity. If I say this glass is full, we might sometimes add to overflowing, but technically, if we simply use the word full in its basic, most basic meaning, we mean it's right to the brim. You can't put any more in. You might pour more into the glass, but stuff goes out equal to what you pour in. So it's quantity. You can measure it. It's also used of time. In the fullness of time. You've read that in the scripture, haven't you? In the fullness of time. When the time is up, when it's, when it's reached its pinnacle of whatever it is that's going on. Um, we could say uh, a woman who's pregnant, that, that um, when the birth is imminent, that the time is full, complete, for 
of the pregnancy. But the other use of fill has to do with relationships. And it basically means to be influenced by, under the control of. So here's the comparison then. Don't get under the, don't be under the influence of wine, because that's not helpful. But rather, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. If we get that, and it's pretty simple, I think, but if we get that, it enables us to uh, rejoice in the blessing that is ours because of Jesus giving his life and sending his spirit to indwell us, which happens at conversion. Now, if we want to get really technical here, and I will, <laughs> um, your baptism of the spirit at conversion is probably accompanied by the filling of the Spirit. They go together at that point. Why then, and we talking about them as separate? Well, because we can lose the influence of the Spirit in our lives by our sin. Our sin is basically saying to God, no, nah, don't want your control, don't want your influence, stay out. I've got this sorted, I'll do it my way. When we do it my way, we're not doing it God's way, pretty much. If God has nudged us and pointed us in a direction that's clear either in Scripture or just simply to our spirit, by His Spirit. So, the words be, be filled with the Spirit are actually words of a command. How long are you going to? Oh, there we go. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a little mini Greek lesson. I wouldn't normally do this uh, in sermons. You probably will not hear me mention Greek again uh, in the time I'm with you. But this is a command. And it's, first of all, it's in the second person plural. That means it's you, whoever's reading it, pretty much, and plural, you and the group you are in, if you like. It's really saying the group. Paul is talking to the church in Ephesus. And to the church he's saying, you are believers, so you all are being addressed. And that includes us because we are reading those same words and the same spirit is in us and the same everything else applies. It's also imperative, which means it's a command. You know, it's imperative that you be filled. It's in the present tense. Now, the present tense in Greek is actually different to what we know as the present tense in English. So I'm going to ignore the English for the moment and just say that the idea of the present tense in Greek is that it's a process thing where you, you continually are doing that thing, whatever it is. And we need to do what we can do to be filled continually because we sin pretty frequently. Like, you know, some of us are probably racking it up into the tens and twenties today already. Uh, others may have been one or two, whatever. But we've all had those moments where we kind of, yeah, don't do what we ought to do. We're not who we should be. And we need to surrender again to Christ. So it's not a once and for all experience. It's something that actually um, takes place over time and repeatedly. So what are the conditions for us to uh, be filled? Because there is a human side, but ultimately, oh sorry, and I jumped over a slide, it's in the passive, which means it's not something we can do to ourselves, but rather it's something God does to us. God is the one who is the filling. So the first thing we need to be sure about if we're hoping that we're going to be filled with the Spirit is 
The first question is, are you a believer? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus? If you have, then that's the first part. You have to be born again before the Spirit will fill you. In terms of what Paul is talking about. Now, can God do that to an individual um, that's open in some way, who's not even a Christian, but is open to God, not knowing anything about Christianity? Sure can. But it's different. It's more like the Old Testament where it comes and goes, but not in the sense we're talking about because of sin, but because of the purposes of God. We must be living in obedience to the known will of God. What do you know that God wants of you? Are you doing it? That's the second step. If we're not living in obedience, it means we're what? Living in sin, doesn't it? Because that's pretty much the definition of sin. And thirdly, we must be repentant as we become aware of sin in our lives. So we repented when we were born again, yes. But because we sin, we continually need to be repenting of that which God makes us aware of in our lives or our conscience makes us aware of in our lives or other people make us aware of in our lives. And then finally, we must be willing to surrender the control of our lives to Christ. That's in both an attitude and an action ultimately. The attitude is, yes, Lord, whatever you desire. The action is when we get a prompting from the Spirit, we obey that prompting. So next week, I want to look at what are the evidences that we might see in someone who is filled with the Spirit? What will it look like? How can we tell insofar as it's possible? Sometimes you won't be able to tell, by the way, that actually what's happening right now in and through their lives is the Spirit at work because it might be contrary to the way you think it should be. And God is doing a work in them that hopefully will overflow to you. So the Spirit, the, the filling of the Spirit then is to live under the influence of the Holy Spirit. How are you going? Are you living your life with the intention of being open to God's Spirit to, alert, to guide and direct you in life? You should be. We're commanded to be in that place. I want to encourage you, if you're unsure of any of this, please come and talk to me. If you disagree with me, please come and talk. Maybe because I don't have my notes, I might have said something back the front uh, and unintentionally created an error. And in that case, you'll hear about it next week if somebody can alert me to that fact. So please feel free to do any of those things. Um, so let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as those for whom you have died and rose again to bring us new life and to send your spirit into this world, we, we come and ask that you would help us in our journey to be aware of any sin in our lives that we might come in repentance to you and that we might then be available to you to use in whatever way you choose and for your glory's sake. We pray this in your great name, Lord Jesus. Amen.